Welcome to No Instructions. I'm Bob. And I'm Josh. What's up? Hey, buddy. Got some, uh, got some iron machines there. I got some stuff. And some comic funny books. <laughs> some of them funny papers. <laughs> yeah, so I've got... I haven't seen it. Can I look at one Yeah, of go for I it. I have not actually looked at these yet. Yeah, this... Okay. So if you don't know, the last episode I was working on this War Machine model, the Marvel's character... And I have some comic books, so if you're watching the video, you can see. I have comic books of the Punisher, from where Punisher took over War Machine's armor and flew off and did Punisher stuff. And so I'm going to paint up the rest of this model. It has a base coat of like a metallic gray on it, and I'm going to paint it up to look like Punisher in the comic books. But, but, the cover art, which is beautifully done, and then the actual panels in the comic book are different. You know, I was just going to say that. Yeah. Because I, I've not looked at this at all, and I was just flipping through it going, oh, the, the panels are a little disappointing. Yeah. Well, covers. Super the good. covers are, are beautiful. And then it switches halfway through between, like, this is a uh, war machine punch, and this is, like, war criminal or something. So, like, somebody drew them differently. Oh. Yeah. But still, inside, his armor looks different. Like, the thighs are gray, and, like, some of the hands and stuff are gray. Because I think in this whole storyline, the armor that he gets got, like, so messed up. Because he got, like, a nuclear weapon launched at him. Hmm. And so that there are some S.H.I.E.L.D. agents who also have armor, and he kind of stole theirs and had to, like, hijack a guy to get him to fix it. So uh. I think I'm going to go with the cover art. Yeah. Um, and just do like the skull, some weathering. I think maybe on the biceps is kind of gray, kind of difficult to tell. It's a little surprising that when they drew this, well, I guess it's not. I was going to say that they didn't take the skull motif and put it on the helmet instead of on the chest. Well, there are some toys that you can buy that have it on the skull and the chest, and it looks dumb. Well, I, I think, think yeah, I think one or the other would probably be yeah. able to do it. But. Huh. Well, that's cool. The, the model looks awesome. Well, I think it's. Just the War Machine's War, Machine awesome. um, War Machine's original armor. The face is gray anyway, and so if uh, Frank Castle were to take it over, then he would just draw it on his chest to kind oh, of mimic the shirt. His own, yeah, true. So I have to try to figure out which one of these uh, panels or pieces are going to stay War Machine, and which ones are going to become the Punisher. What are you doing? You're doing something new. I'm working on a new set. I'm working on, in case you're looking at the thing, the new. Apollo 11 Lunar Lander set. Oh, I have it off screen. Check that out. This is uh, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. The first moon landing. Well, yeah. True. Yeah. Um, so this is the, the whole lander, and right now I'm working on the lunar surface, which is black and gray, as you would expect. It, I really, really love this model. I bought one for myself. And I put it together at my house while my wife and I were working in the secret room. <laughs> and it was funny because she was on her computer sitting across from me. And I'm building it. And she can just see this, like, look of joy on my face. <laughs> and then whenever I would, like, I got the um, the legs and, like, the base that is actually, like, still on the moon. I got that part done. And it's, like, gold. And it's it's really yeah. well done. And even in the book, it documents some of the highlights of the, the lunar landing yeah. and the different pieces and, like, the different quadrants of doors. It's got the camera and stuff on it. It's really well done. So, like, in this instruction booklet, I'm, I'm a couple of pages into the instructions. Let's see. It's right here. This is page 40. That's when the instructions start. Oh, so, yeah. before that, there's it's multiple languages. So, yeah. there's the same thing several times. But there's pages of details, photos... All sorts of stuff around space travel. Oh, and wait that camera can see it. Oh, yeah, okay, look, look down here. Yeah. Ah, oh, For the mic frozen. Yeah, so if you're looking, uh, they've got some drawings and some photos and all sorts of stuff. It's really cool. I mean, they, they definitely put some time into not just the Lego portion of it. They're celebrating yep. the whole thing, which is really cool. And they did it justice. I mean, uh, the Lunar Lander, there was an old set. So they've already done this, but it was smaller. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. And then I think it might have been actually your brother wrote me a message on Instagram when I did it and said that he used to have it. Huh. But I, I oh, tried to find really? the old set, but it was smaller. And this is one of the model kits that when I was looking for model kits, I was looking for the Lunar Lander. But all the Lunar Landers I could find are really small, and they're not hmm. that detailed. 
And then when they came out with this one, I'm like, those are two worlds colliding into a beautiful thing. And yeah. Like, I love space. I love the space program. I love the idea that we as a, as a people can come together and explore and do something that we as a, a, you know, a race of beings have never done before. And to celebrate, like, smart people mm-hmm. achieving something awesome. I love that. So building this, like, I, <laughs> Tiff would look over and she'd giggle at me. I'm like, what? She's like, you're just, like, staring at it. <laughs> and I would spin it around. I'd look all. And, and yeah, you're, like, checking out all the details. It was so good. I mean, that's, what you say there is a really good point about the space program that I guess I've no, never really thought about, is that it's one of the few things done by the human race that could not be done by a single person. Nope. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, a person could design, and has designed, really amazing things. A person could theoretically build a lot of things by themselves, but there's no way space travel could happen by a single person. Mm-mm. There's just too many disciplines involved. Mm-hmm. Across awesome. so many different companies and geographic locations, and like as a project, it is amazing. And to look at like the astronauts, like the Mercury Seven astronauts or Neil Armstrong, are like those are the people that were on the moon. Mm-hmm. And to think about every single person and every single process that had to to been put in place and to executed for that step on the moon to happen is mind boggling. It is. Yeah. It is. And so that's the stuff that I, I think is just truly amazing. I mean, people can make new cars, like a different model of car that people really enjoy. They're, you know, motorheads. They enjoy that. And I'm like, yeah, but it, it's still a car. It's still four wheels driven by a gasoline engine that goes around. It looks cool. It looks neat. Or an electric engine. Sure. Or an electric motor. Like, hurry for that. Uh, like, rockets to the moon. Like, that's yeah. bonkers. No one's ever done that. Well, and now they're talking well, about doing it again. Yeah. They're doing it again. Yeah. Yeah. Has like a, a launch, not say a launch pad, that's a silly pun, as a, a precursor to Mars expeditions. Well, it is a launch pad. I mean, they're they're trying yeah. to create a, a way station, Yep, a way to, to be able to launch from there. Um, when I was at ThinkerCon, um, Don Pettit, who's a, an astronaut. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I got to meet and hang out with Don Pettit. You wrote me a message. <laughs> I was like, hey, I'm hanging out with Don Pettit. And I'm like, hold on, I know someone named Don Pettit. <laughs> <laughs> like, like the astronaut Don Pettit, and I wrote you back like the astronaut Don Pettit. You're like, yeah, <laughs> like, and he's super cool. Yep, I'm he's super he would cool. Be. And when you ask him, when people would like ask him what he did, because everybody there was like did interesting stuff, and except for me. And so like, <laughs> people would ask, you know, like, what do you do? And he would go, I make coffee cups. That was mm-hmm. his response, mm-hmm. and he made coffee cups that you can drink coffee in space. But he would leave that part out. Um, but he gave this talk about. He calls it the tyranny of the rocket equation. And this talk was about how much goes into and how improbable it is for us to leave our own atmosphere. Like, to get to the moon, Mm -hmm. it is... I think... I can't remember the numbers. It's been a while since I heard him talk about it. But the for everything to line up and for us to have everything we need and the amount of fuel to the amount of weight and all this different stuff and beating gravity and the way the moon and the earth are in position to each other all of that stuff has to be exactly right for us to be able to leave our atmosphere yep and we are just barely able to do it and that's pretty amazing like when you hear him talk about it he spent a lot of time up there and he's like it's unreal it's unbelievable that we can even do this we shouldn't be able to get away but we can, just barely. I watched his very first <coughs> space shuttle launch in person. Really? Yep. That's cool. Yep. It was a night launch. Mm. And it was amazing. I was in Orlando at UCF studying aerospace engineering. So I wanted to go. And I wanted to be an astronaut. And I'm watching a shuttle launch from not that far away. And it lit up the entire horizon. Oh, really? It was amazing. Because you, you do like a countdown... Because you kind of had an idea of when it was supposed to go. And then you like, people start counting because we're not there next to the giant clock. And then like it reaches zero and nothing kind of happens. You're like, what's happening? Uh-oh. And then it's like, <laughs> the entire night sky in that direction just lit up. Could you feel, at that distance, could you feel anything? Was no, there it any was no. Of a pressure change or anything? Uh, not really. Hmm. We were on top of like a two or three story car garage. Um, our parking garage. And I don't remember feeling any like rumble or anything like that. I just remember like, I remember thinking like, that's what a nuclear bomb must look like. Mm. 
Uh, yeah, probably yeah. pretty similar. <laughs> like it was crazy. Huh. And just watching the shuttle, like it wasn't even like a shuttle, it was just this big, massive glowing orb. Just, just like go up. on up. And then every <laughs> once in a while it would like it would do a little flicker thing, like something was happening, some rockets were separating or something. Yeah. And then it just became a tinier little dot. And then it was like, Well, that was amazing. Hmm. Time to go eat dinner now. Yeah. But it's weird, like you watch that, you're like, wow, that's neat, just because it looked pretty, not, wow, that's an amazing feat of engineering. Right. And people are leaving the pull of this planet right then, and like, well, oh, I just look cool, <laughs> now let's let's go to Chili's. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen uh, some pictures of uh, people in California who have watched SpaceX launches, and mm-hmm. I think the weird thing about those launches versus the ones in Florida, I mean, I've never watched one from Florida, so I don't, maybe I'm wrong on this, but... It's pretty far from everything in Florida. Is that right? I mean, yeah. You, so you're kind of, you have to go yeah, to Yeah, Kennedy it. Space Center and like Patrick Air Force Base and Cape Canaveral Air Base, it's purposely like in a barrier island. So it's like sticking off the coast. Right. So there's a lot of waterways and it's a natural like wildlife preserve. And so there's purposely not a lot around it. And I've been, I've been there, but I've just never actually seen, I've been to Cape Canaveral, Cape Canaveral, but I've never actually seen a launch. But in California, people driving around in L.A. can just, like, mm-hmm. stop driving and look up and see a SpaceX launch. And so yeah. there's been some really cool photos of, like, different parts of the city with this big glowing arc running mm-hmm. over it through the sky. And I think that's pretty awesome. Well, it's really fun. Well, not, I guess, fun for me. Uh, when I worked at Lockheed, I used to work for the Navy, and we used to launch uh, submarine, Trident missiles from submarines. And so... Canaveral Air Base is also the head of the, it was called ER, the Eastern Range. So it's just a big fan that goes out into the ocean, and that's where they test fire rockets and missiles and space shuttles and all that stuff. And so when they talk about, like, the range being cleared as part of the, like, go, no-goes for fly, for launch, there could be, like, an airplane or a boat or things like that mm. in this massive just drawing on a map to make sure that nothing is out there in case something bad happened. Hmm. So whenever I was on the East Coast... Well, for the, the Navy's East Coast Fleet, we would launch all of our test missiles from ER, from the Eastern Range. For the Pacific Fleet, it's on the Western Range, and the Western Range is on Brandenburg Air Force Base, which is out near L.A. Right. So anytime they launch stuff, and sometimes it's a night launch, sometimes it's a day launch, but if it's a night launch, ever the most well, one of the most populated cities in America gets to see yeah. this scary-looking, illuminating, you know, missile UFO-looking thing in the night sky. Hmm. And so it's just kind of proximity to to people. Yeah. To where in Canaveral, there's still the outlying areas around there, like Cocoa Beach and Orlando is still kind of in, you know, uh, uh, in the coastline. But it's nothing like <laughs> at Brandenburg where people can just look up and see stuff. Yeah. And so I remember when the, the people on the Pacific Coast did uh, a test launch, like we knew about it because we were in that world. And then we're like, oh, how'd the test launch go? They're like, oh, it went fine. You're like, the world freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> because everybody thought that they were like either being invaded or there were aliens or there's you know whatever and like oh it's just a, a submarine test firing a missile that's pretty wild yeah and even that can like people don't believe that it's the same thing with the like weather balloons and ufos out in roswell and all this and they did there's so much missile testing and stuff that goes out in the desert especially back in new mexico and things back in the, the 40s and 50s and yeah so, I mean, people can believe what they want to believe, but there's a super high likelihood that it was just, yeah, it's a, it's a missile test. People trying to make weapons and rockets and stuff. Yeah, it's more fun to think about aliens, though. Yeah. I mean, I'm not discounting the fact that there could be aliens. I don't know any better, but... Right. Cool. Yeah. Well, what else is, is up? I'm painting this thing. Painting this thing. I'm so kind of now- scared to paint. Um, so... Are you taking any license here, or are you trying to... I kind of have to, because there is not... That paint is stinky. Woo! Oh, yeah, it's... What is this, acrylic paint? Model nope. Paint? <laughs> Doesn't oily, smell acrylic. Stinky paint? This is... Oh, it's made of rotten eggs. Ah, oh, yes. Enamel. I don't know. It's yeah. paint. It's it's like model paint. Sure. It's all stinky. Um... So am I taking license? I think I have to because there's not one set like frame of this thing looking the way it should look. Like I said, with even in the comic book, there's there's deviations from page to page. Hmm. And I think the one I'm using right now um, for the chest, I'm going to use this piece. People in the video can see. 
Uh, it's Iron Man and War Machine, like, fighting it out. So War Machine is ripping out Iron Man's arc reactor. And so it has a good shot of kind of the chest, like, Punisher logo thing. And then the rest of it is just, like, artistic paint streaks. So I got to kind of fill in the blanks. So in that storyline, does Iron Man end up getting the armor back? I don't want to ruin it for you. Oh, well, I'll probably want to But, yeah, but I yeah, mean, they... don't have to do it for anybody else. So the, the storyline goes that Punisher was hired by S.H.I.E.L.D., to go to this country and like mistake rem- number one, remove a dictator, and Shield is bad, and then uh, Frank Castle, who's Punisher, goes around and just like ends up just killing a bunch of bad guys. And at a certain point, they're like, "All right, you need to quit." And he's like, "No, I don't need to quit because I'm Punisher, and I don't know if you know this about me, but I kind of <laughs> I can't let go of things. Yeah, I don't quit, <laughs> and I don't listen to authority." And so they send, like, all of the Marvel heroes kind of after him. He comes back to New York, and that's when, like, Spider-Man and Captain Marvel and a bunch of people, like, in, I think it's this one, or the one before, Captain Marvel and a bunch of people try to to get him, and hmm. he evades them quite cleverly, ends up sitting on the subway in his, like, war machine army. <laughs> but awesome. then Iron Man shows up, and like, they kind of fight, and then uh, Rhodey? Rhodey shows back up, yep. and he's like, yo, give him my suit back. He's like, okay. Yeah, that's pretty much what it was. He's like, sorry, Colonel. And he was like... Really? Yeah. He's like, Lieutenant, get out of my suit. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry, Colonel. Here's your suit back. Uh, <laughs> that's lame. Yeah. This, I am finished with the lunar surface, in case you want to see this. I mean, overhead shot there. Ooh, look at that. Ooh, wait, wait. I got a little backwards. There we go. That's what the moon looks like. That would be awesome if that's what the moon looked like. If it had Lego <laughs> studs all over the place. <laughs> Except for we would build this really complex... Um, you know, lander, and it would go land, and then it couldn't take off again because it, it would get stuck. stuck. They would need to get the part separator. That's right. <laughs> Ooh, I just had a really good idea for a project. Okay, I'm going to set that aside and go to bag. Bags two. Shit. Here. What are we dump, about? Dumping some bags. I don't know. Uh, we have some pros and cons from Discord, from mm-hmm. the patron Discord. Uh, we could do that. Um, any other? I know we talked about like the camping trip and summer and stuff. Any other changes or like summer plans or like you talked about the the checklist the that your family was doing. Yep. Have you guys Our done bucket any list? Of bucket list. That's what it was. Um, we went to a, a movie at the old theater. I'm gonna dump this. Ooh. Oh, there's so many bags. There's bags and bags and bags. This may go oh. along with one of our pros and cons, so I'll, I'll save that. But yeah, we went to go see a movie at like the really old theater downtown, which is really nice. Mm. Um, one of them was like make some popsicles, mm-hmm. and I found a recipe from Bon Appetit that had like butterscotch popsicles. Ooh. Yeah, it sounded pretty awesome. Ooh. Instead of like fudgesicles or butterscotchicles, butterscotchicles, <laughs> butterscotchicles. <laughs> Yep. There's a title for you. Butterscotchicles. Have you made those yet? No. Oh, I want that to. sounds really good. Save but you. I'm also trying Save to you. like eat better and not eat as much sugar. Okay. Well, you can just make one. I'll tell you if it's good or not. Yeah. Just... <laughs> oh, my bad. I hit the microphone with War Machine's hand. Okay. I'm done with the bags. Oh, there was a lot of pieces in those bags. Mm-hmm. There's somebody out there screaming, you should know those. I know it, but I'm no. not going to. Yeah, no, don't do that. Not gonna do it. Waste time. Anyway, okay, yeah. So summertime list. You've added some things, done a couple of them. We've been swimming like almost every day. Good. It makes my heart happy. That's awesome. I love the water. My kids are loving the water. Uh, my daughter, who is just insane, <laughs> jumps in the water with no floaties and goes underwater, and it's great. What at what age did your boys? start to um, like really take a hold of swimming to where you were comfortable that they could kind of do it on their own? Probably last year. My oldest son, my middle son, still doesn't want to go in the water without me. The other day he went in the pool without me with his floaties on for the first time like by himself. Hmm. And I had to like throw a football in there. I'm like, just go get it. Like it's fun. And he kind of just went and, and puttered around for a little bit. And So swimming is really fun in a way. But not fun in other ways because I am like a lifeguard and I did water survival and I'm a rescue diver. But my kids, and I've never, I mess with my kids, but I never mess with my kids in the water. I don't want to set that negative association. I don't want to set any kind of fear. I want them to be relaxed and comfortable. 
and they will not listen to me in a pool. Hmm. I have taught probably a hundred people how to swim. Grown adults, small kids, elderly, in between, and my kids think I'm the dumbest person when it's in the water. They don't trust no, me. It's just because you're dad. If you were maybe you, but someone else, not dad, you know, they would totally listen. We um we had a pool in Savannah. And so when we moved into that house, our oldest, who is now 11, was nine months old. And so we were in that house for nine-ish years. And so all of the kids, you know, from birth pretty much grew up with the pool. And we took them in, I mean, like really early. Because Jenny's dad uh, taught swimming. And so like Jenny learned when she was an infant, you know, like he taught infants all the time and mm-hmm. we'd take them in and everything. And so we just started doing that and they could all, I was really happy about this. I'm not saying this to boast, but I was really surprised and happy that they could all swim on their own in the deep end by three. That's impressive. And it was crazy. Cause I never expected that. I always mm-hmm. thought like, you know, they will be in floaties for a long time or whatever. And sometimes they would wear them when they didn't need them and stuff like that. But I knew that they could, we could throw them in the deep end and they would be perfectly fine to get there, you know, get out. And of course, we never let them in the pool by themselves without us anyway, just because that's a good thing to do. But I was really happy and it made, it made the pool a lot more fun knowing that we didn't have someone who was like, we really had to watch every yeah. single second. You know, obviously you want to pay attention and all that, but. Um, so when they get to that age, to where they're all just like in, it becomes so much more fun as an adult to be a part of that, for me anyway. But I also did. I mean, like Jenny was a lifeguard, and you've had that training, and you guys may be more aware and more attentive to that stuff than I was too. You know, I don't, I don't know how that changes your th- enjoyment of other people swimming. I think it's, if anything, growing up in the water and having that level of training is that you realize that the stuff in the water is not as big a deal as people think it is. Hmm. Like if someone goes underwater and they may be in duress, like they're like, Oh my God, they're drowning. Like they're not drowning. It takes a long time for you to drown. Hmm. Then to the minutes of you being submerged underwater, like you can go underwater, pass out and wake back up underwater. Hmm. Yeah. Weird. I have interviewed many people that that's happened. People who have crashed in the water and who have were like tried to get out and couldn't get out. And passed out. I thought they were dead. And they woke up underwater again and figured out where they were going and got out. Whoa. That's crazy. No lie. Huh. And so a lot of people have this inaccurate perception because, you know, because of just fear. And it's it's a healthy fear, I, I think. Yeah. Of the water. And, like, the water's going to die. You can't breathe. Therefore, you're going to die. Yeah. And I remember when my daughter fell in one time when she didn't have her floaties on. And... Their eyes, people, their kids get eyes get really big because they don't know what's going on. They're kind of scared, and they're like, "Ah!" Everybody starts to freak out, and like, like, calm down. She's okay. And mm-hmm. you just kind of walk over there and pick their head up, get their head out of the water. Yeah, they're okay. They're not gonna die. They're gonna cough it up. They're not gonna inhale water. Your body won't do that until probably after you're dead because your body tends to do that. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. It's it's the ability to to maintain a calm to where around a pool, especially little kids around a pool. People are already on edge, and their yeah. nerves are already kind of ready to fire. Right. To where it's like, eh, it'll be okay. Just chill a little bit. So on that note, like you're talking about uh, kids inhaling water, a thing that, I don't know who taught us this, but early on, one of the ways we got more got the kids more comfortable with being in the water and having to hold air in their mouth and not keep their mouth open, because like their tendency is to just have their mouth open all the time when you mm-hmm. throw them in. They scream or they cry or they whatever. And so one thing you can do is... When you've got an infant infant in the water, you blow in their face, mm-hmm. like right in their eyes, and they go, <gasps> and they take a big breath in, and then they close their mouth, kind of just by nature, yep. and then you dunk them, and they've got a mouthful of air, so they're not going to inhale on the way down. Then you hold them there for just a second, and then you lift them up and let them breathe and everything. And you do that enough times, they don't get scared of going under the water because they know that they have air with them. But you, love, when you bring them back up, you laugh and you giggle. Yeah, you make it fun. It's like, all super smiles. Yep. And it's it's stuff that on first glance, I mean, it was really kind of shocking to me. I think the first time I met somebody who didn't know how to swim was when I was in the Army. And it kind of hmm. like, I'm like, what do you mean you don't know how to swim? It's like you're not good at it? Or you're just, you're not a fast swimmer? They're like, no, I don't know how. Mm-hmm. And it's because of the environment I grew up in. 
I'm sorry, I keep hitting the microphone with this model. Um, and then whenever I became a, a water survival instructor, we taught flight school students how to react, or all aviators, myself included, how to react to crashing in the water. And so we had like a simulator that was designed to crash in the water and then have a very purposeful exit plan and then a backup plan. That's the dunker train? Dunker train, yeah. So yeah, Destin from Smarter Every Day did a video on it and that's what I used to do. And seeing like super hardcore, tough, like soldiers, man, storming into buildings and like ripping Nazis face off and like, <laughs> really? Be just crying at the, the sight of water. Hmm. And understanding that people have a completely different background than you do, and they have triggers, and they've had stuff in their past that they don't want to talk about, but it has shaped the way that they are as a human. Mm -hmm. And when you hit that nerve, ooh, hmm. it's impactful. And you don't know what it is. And yeah. most people don't tend to gravitate toward that thing that makes them super scared or nervous. And so when they're put in that predicament where it's a you have to, or you're you know, going to have punitive action, you're not going to be able to you know, progress through flight school or, you know, not be on flight status or whatever, you know, they're confronted with this thing that everything in their body tells them no. Hmm. And then there's just some dude in a wetsuit that tells them yes. And then it's, it's those environments that made me stop and appreciate people and appreciate the differences in people. Hmm. Because it's a very soldierly thing to go like, no, you better do it. You're a no go at this station. You could do it over again or you fail, go away. And you can be very angry and stoic about it, but that doesn't help anybody. Right. Like to be able to get, we talked about it last episode, like talking about getting to the heart of an issue. And there were so many people that would fail. And so they had to come back for remedial training. So every morning, like I would teach grown adults how to swim hmm. who like stepping foot in the pool, they were crying huh. to eventually work up to like, I'm going to put you inside this conversion van type size thing, raise it up to the roof and Drop dunk you it. underwater <laughs> and you have to not die. Huh. And there were many students that would like sobbingly come up soaking wet, hugging us after the fact, going like, I can be a pilot. I can do the thing that I've wanted to do since I was a child because mm -hmm. of you guys. That's awesome. Yeah, it was super rewarding. And at the same time, for us, it was kind of nothing. Because it was like, oh, this is fun. I get to watch you flop around underwater uncomfortably and you yeah. make silly faces and um, think you're dying when you're not dying. But it's people's fears are... Like, are yeah. nothing to, to joke at, I think, because right. the, you know, the fight or flight thing that people talk about, like if you're confronted with a mugger, you know, you could either flee or you could stand your ground. But this was, or that particular was one environment where you, people would choose to flee, but they are weightless in the dark, upside down, underwater. And so there's nowhere to they flee. You can't flee. Well, they're trying, but they're not going anywhere. Or they're wedging themselves inside of controls or inside of panels where they're ultimately just going to die if you flee. Hmm. And so besides overcoming somebody's fear, you have to get somebody to stop being afraid for this moment to calm down and to think logically and rationally when every single nerve in their body tells them not to. Hmm. And it is so amazing to just like physically be inches away from someone when they figure that out for themselves. Man, it was so awesome. It mm. was so rewarding. That was my favorite part That's cool. is to watch somebody just lose their mind. And I'm like, I've got my hand to grab them and to open a door and throw them out to a safety diver. Right. And then they just compose themselves 12 mm. feet underwater in the dark and then go. That's and I'm like, awesome. that was that little moment where that thing clicked for you. Yeah. Where you just overcame you listened to, to attentive and purposeful teaching, and hopefully this moment will stick with you forever. Well, I was going to say, like, at that point, once, I mean, generally, once you get that, the next time you're in that situation, it's probably easy. Like, oh, I survived this last time, and this is what I did, yep. so now I can do it again, and it's not as scary, and my reaction time will be you know, quicker, and that's probably pretty a great feeling for them, not only to get through it once, but then when they're in that situation again... To be like, oh, yeah, I can handle this. Yep. Because hmm. as part of my bachelor's degree, I did a research paper on Army air crews that died in the water. <laughs> because the Army has this idea, which, I mean, has some kind of merit. They're like, well, we're not in the Navy. We're not flying over water when there are so many airports that are flying over water. And so they discount it as valid training. And hmm. They'd rather be like marching around in the desert and shooting guns and doing hua stuff instead of playing around in the pool because a lot of times they didn't join the Navy because they don't like the water. 
And so people are in charge, don't like the water, and they don't see the value in it. And they don't see the value in it from that perspective. That I just gave this person, or we as a team gave this person the ability to literally overcome the thing that they hate most in their entire life. And the thing that could kill them if they're not. Right. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, I, I don't work there anymore because it was a contract job and the Army just got rid of the contract. And hmm. they didn't place a, a high level of importance on that training. And from what I understand, there is the pool has been filled in and it is a car wash now on Fort Rucker. So That's a drag. It makes me sad because, you know, to see the impact that purposeful teaching and someone who kind of cares about the outcome whether or not that's public school or, or, you know, that conversation can be had in that same light. Giving somebody that attention and that amount of caring mm -hmm. to see them want to succeed and then watching it, it may take a long time. And the military is not known for being graceful and giving people the amount of time to do something that they should have done right the first time. Right. But watching it pay off, like there's nothing, literally nothing that person can do now. Hmm. And it's awesome. And so, I want that to happen for my kids in the water. And it's the same... Oh, yeah. Like, your first step to doing anything in the water is calm down. You can do so. You can float. You cannot die. You can do so many things when you don't freak out. Just calm down. Right. Step one. Um, talking about this is a left turn, but <clears throat> talking about teachers. So, I've had my aunt is a teacher. She's been a teacher for a long time. I've known a bunch of teachers. My kids all have fantastic teachers who obviously care a lot about them. Um, at both of the schools that we've been in. Oh, no. Losing lights again. But luckily, we have the light that Anthony put up, so we're not completely in it. Good dark. job, Anthony. Um, but without being in a school often, you know, in the teaching part of a school versus the everybody get together in the gym part, um, you don't see, I don't see a lot of the specific care that teachers have for their students. And... This is kind of hokey, but it, it brought this up in my mind. So there's a show on now called Schooled. Okay. And it's a sequel or a spinoff from The Goldbergs, which is a great comedy you know, show. I love it. And so this is a spinoff of some of those same characters, and it's set in a school that plays a big part in um, The Goldbergs. But it's around, like, the cast of characters are the teachers and then some of the students. So the students are kind of the supporting characters to the teachers. Hmm. But the thing about that is <clears throat> they could have just made it a very, um, here's a group of people who happen to be teachers and the setting is the school and that's it. Right. But almost every episode that we watched, because it, it came out a few months ago and we found it on Hulu and like watched all 12 of them or whatever within a couple weeks. And every episode ends up with some sort of a, the teachers realizing that they were doing something wrong or something silly or something because they care so much about the students. And mm. they were, you know, break, willing to break the rules or do something maybe the wrong way because they thought it was in a student's best interest. And it's, it's a comedy and everything, but at the end of every one of those, I'm like, this show's actually like a really good banner for teachers. Yeah. Because it legitimately shows, I mean, it's fake, but it legitimately shows... Uh, people who are underpaid and overworked and dealing with horrible high school and middle school kids, but they keep doing it because they care about how these kids are going to turn out. And then at the end of the show, they have like a little segment during the credits that is one of the teachers that the show is based on, because the whole show is based on this guy, Adam Goldberg's school. And his real teachers. And so they have, the characters have the same names and they have a lot of the same traits. Oh, and they wow. look very similar. And so they always have the real teacher that is in the story in this last little segment and they ask him questions. And I think that's part of what makes it kind of real is because they'll ask those teachers a question about like, you know, like one of the coaches. They're like, you know, what's your favorite part of coaching? And he would say this little thing about how seeing people without confidence and then all of a sudden they get confidence through sports and then they realize that they're actually smarter than they thought they were too. And so, yep. you know, stuff like that. Um, but having those actual teachers at the end, it makes it, the show a little bit more real. Anyway, it's a good mm. show and I think it's got more than comedy to it, which is cool. a good thing. Yeah. It's, it's worth watching. And in that same... Set in the 90s. Exactly that point. When we would get a student because 
the way the dunker training fell before any actual like flight stuff. They would learn a bunch of academics. They would go through like beginning officer training, and then they would come to us, and then they would do seer training, which looks um, as part of like a weed out process. Hmm. And so when we would start to talk to some of the students, you could see the confidence level on some of them because they're just they're new college graduates, or you would get a unit of people who had already been in the army for a long time, but a majority of the students were just fresh college graduates. And seeing, uh, like, looking at people, and you can just kind of tell, like, that person doesn't believe in themselves. Mm. Or that person has massive doubts about what they're doing or has that level of imposter syndrome. Yeah. And I'm like, and this is going to bring it out. Hmm. Out of anything, people can talk a big talk all they want to until their water, their face goes underwater, and then they lose it. Right. Or you see the people that are marginalized in a class um, because you're in the water, and traditionally, ladies float better in water than, than men do. Or if someone is a little overweight, they tend to float better in water than the muscle-bound, like, A1 Captain Americas do. You see people, um, I remember we had some, like, really short females that you could kind of tell that they were on the, the fringe, not necessarily of their confidence level, but, I mean, they're in the military, so it's harder for females in the military, right. hands down. Yeah. And I'm like, they are going to rock this more than than... Eagle Scout football captain over there. Why is that? Because there's because of the way that your body's put together. Because of the, oh, the right. way that females' bodies are put together, they can float. We had this thing that where you had to float for two minutes. And you see people lose their mind. Lose their mind. Try to drown me, and then I get to hold them underwater till they stop freaking out, and then pop them back up and save their life. <laughs> that part in the Guardian, did you see that Coast Guard movie? No. Well, there's a Coast Guard movie where they did this, where like a guy is swimming underwater, and he's like jumps up, and it's part of lifeguard training, where they... You have to escape like a panicked person. Well, our panicked huh. people would like go up to 11. And so you have to be able to maintain control of someone who is losing their mind, flailing around, trying to hurt you because they think you are like a buoy. So they're going to try to drown you to try to get themselves out of water. And so there's a lot of different techniques and ways that the Red Cross will teach you. And then there's ways that like the Navy rescue swimmer course will teach you. And so we would use those. Hmm. And so while Captain America over there is struggling because he's got super jacked up muscles and a really low uh, fat content in his body and can't uh, float that well, the the girl who is smaller or the chubby guy or whoever who is a little marginalized in the class has zero problem with that. Hmm. So the all the tables, especially for like physical fitness evaluations, right. are completely turned. They're huh. like, the chubbier you are, the easier this is probably going to be for you. And so hmm. it was the great equalizer to see people right. get in there like, oh, you have to swim. You're like, well, like how far? You got to swim from there to there to there. It's really easy. And you had to do it in uniform. And so it just naturally took people out of their element. Yeah. And you could see people who were calm and then see people who would talk a big game. I'm like, that guy is nervous talking. Mm. And that's going to be fun. Because <laughs> he's going to lose it. <laughs> and we got to be you know, pretty decent judges of, of character. And kind of the, the psychological you know, play that goes on in people's minds when they're, when they're scared. So it was just, it was so much fun just because it was cool, but yeah. it was also fun to like, I, I know more about you right now than, than you do mm. because you know, they have these, these goggles every time it would be, you'd be underwater and just simulate the darkness, they put goggles on. And so when people would freak out or when they'd lose their mind or they lock up, people would just like lock up in terror and not move. And have like a death grip on stuff where I like I have to peel people's fingers back and I'm I'm gonna break your fingers but you're not gonna drown, hmm. and so we would use the force to be able to get somebody out. You, you would use the force, yeah, oh, underwater force, <laughs> where the gungans are. <laughs> <laughs> but like we would get back to the shallow end of the pool. I'm like, all right, so uh, so what happened? They're like, yeah, I did great. I'm like you did great. They're like, yeah, it was great. How was how was it for you? I'm like you didn't do that at all. <laughs> They're like, what are you talking about? And in their head, something would happen. They would look at me, just the most honest face. They're like, yeah, I did this, 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 and this. I'm like, none of that happened. Huh. And so I have GoPro footage on a hard drive of just, like, people losing their mind. And then, like, we as instructors kind of, like, fighting each other because we would just fight underwater to try to improve our, our breath hold. Because we'd hold our breath for probably, I think the longest I did was three minutes when we timed it. But we would just be holding our breath down there. And people would come back and just have this complete, inaccurate perception of what just happened. Weird. And I'm like, uh, none of that happened. Like, I grabbed you and yanked your hands out from a thing because you bumped into people and then you went upside down and got stuck underneath the dash and I had to pull you out. And they're like, what? <laughs> huh. No, 
no, you didn't. I got out all by myself. I'm like, okay, <laughs> we're going to do it again because <laughs> that's not what happened. That's crazy. Yeah, it's super fun. So uh, my mom listens to this podcast, and I'm not trying to call her out or anything, but when we were growing up, um, uh, oh, this is the, no, that's the right piece. When we were growing up, every time we would go on vacation, we always got in the pool, and she would never get in the pool with us. And she just didn't grow up swimming. Mm -hmm. But she made sure, and my dad swam a lot and stuff, and so he would always get in the pool with us. But he couldn't see very well without his glasses, so he couldn't see what he was doing in the pool. Um, anyway, we used to swim a lot with my dad, and my mom would never get in. And every time we would ask her about it, she would say that <laughs> she would say that she was part of the FBI swim team. <laughs> <laughs> and she was undercover. Um, and she didn't want to blow her cover by making it look like she was as good of a swimmer as she was. I always That's thought that awesome. was awesome. My mom's great. But they encouraged us. We didn't have a pool growing up, uh, but they encouraged us to swim, and they would take us to, like, one of the pools here, and, um, you know, we had swim lessons and all that stuff. But I think part of that, and I'm glad they did that because not only did I learn how to swim young, I knew that that was important for our kids, and then Jenny being a lifeguard, she obviously thought it was important as well. So it was nice to, that's been a part of my family, even though, you know, at my, my parents' level, my mom didn't um, growing up. But anyway. Yeah, I took swim lessons when I was a kid. Um, I remember the pool at the Y being just deep. It was like a lap pool, like an Olympic-sized lap pool, and there was no shallow end. <clears throat> and I remember <clears throat> the the... They had a little kickboard thing you'd put underneath your chest. And at a certain point, they would just, like, throw things underwater. And they're like, all right, everybody, one, two, three, go get this stuff underwater. And they're like, this pool's deep. Yeah. Yeah, and not knowing how to, like, Valsalva and equalize your ears. And I'm like, my head's going to explode the deeper I go. And it hurts. And yeah, actually, that was one of the times I popped my eardrum. Oh, really? Yeah, I popped my eardrum twice because it never really healed the first time. And I was underwater, and it wouldn't equalize. I have sinus issues, and I just I blew super hard, and it... Boop, 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 and it bang, it popped, and it had a little bit of blood. Ugh. Ugh. Man. Yikes. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the pool. Um, it was at my junior high school, and I took swim lessons there when I was younger and then ended up going to junior high there. And I guess it was just like a typical Olympic-sized pool, but there was a regular dive and a high dive. And at the age that I was and the size I was at that time, I remember that pool being gigantic mm -hmm. and super deep. <laughs> I guess that's all just a perspective thing, but I mean, growing up in, in Florida, our our school and none of the schools around us, even though we grew up like on the beach, like no one had a swim team. That wasn't a thing. Really? Yeah. I guess maybe they just didn't want to have to upkeep a swimming pool, but no one had swim teams. And I remember seeing them in movies. I'm like, man, I want to be on a swim team. That sounds awesome. Hmm. It just wasn't a thing. You don't know, play football, they got you covered, but yeah, you don't do much anything else. So. I mean, it's kind of weird that there's one here, honestly. I mean, I'm not sure why there was one here, but it was a big thing growing up. And our high school had a swim team, which seemed odd, but I knew a bunch of people that swam on it, and they were really good at it. So, Well, uh, what else we got? Do we have any uh, pros and cons? Oh, we can do cons? the pros and cons, yeah. I'm sorry, everybody. I keep hitting this microphone. Yeah. I'm not being graceful. Send complaints to Josh's email. No, don't do that. Because he'll forward them to me. And I don't want them. Uh, it's on Slack. Slack. Okay. These, Anthony sent me these by way of someone else on the Discord server. Yeah. So this is on the No Instructions Discord. And if you don't know what Discord is, it's like a chat room. Is yeah. that fair to say? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's like a chat server. And uh, people, Patreon supporters of a certain level, have access to this so that everybody can talk to each other and talk to us. Anthony's on it, kind of manning it all the time. And um, so occasionally we'll ask for feedback and topic suggestions and stuff like that and we are trying we started recently trying to give more content to patreon supporters like today we put up tomorrow's project video early for them we're going to do that when we can which isn't going to be all the time but we could today and then we've been making some kind of funny behind the scenes videos for we've been putting out so yeah all right what you got all right so some of these are tv show related so we'll run through these kind of quick. Uh, American Graffiti. Um, honestly, I don't know that I've ever seen it. Uh, I haven't seen it either. I remember it, like some visuals from it and stuff. Um, and my parents watched it. I know they liked it. We had the soundtrack. We had the record. 
but I don't remember. I know it's about hot rods and like teenagers and Harrison Ford's in it. <laughs> and it was kind of the spiritual precursor to Happy Days. Oh, really? I think. I mean, oh. kind of. But that's about all I know about it. So, Like, I know it's not the same thing, but all I can think of is Fast Times at Ridgemont High when I think of American Graffiti. Hmm. I'm, I, there's probably some correlation there. I mean, I, wouldn't, I don't know. Without seeing it, I wouldn't know exactly. But uh, So there are a couple Amazon series. Mm. The Grand Tour. Is that, that's um, the car show, right? With yeah, the so guys? that's the, the guys that did uh, Top Gear, mm -hmm. left Top Gear, and then did the Grand Tour. I've seen a couple episodes of the first season, and, and I didn't really have the thing that Top Gear had, so I didn't watch anymore. Mm. I mean, not, I've not never bad, been but, you know. super into cars, and those those shows are for people who really, really like cars and understand horsepowers and all that. And like, I don't really, I don't know. I do think Top Gear was really because I'm I like cars, but I don't know anything about them, and I think it's cool to see really fast, unique looking things. But I don't know. You could tell me a horsepower number, and I'd be like, "Oh, that's a lot," and they'd be like, "No, actually, that's very little." <laughs> like, oh, well, that's what I meant. It's very little, you know. Um, but I think the cool thing about um, I guess the Grand Tour as well, but uh, Top Gear, was that there was one guy that was super into cars that knew all the details. There's one guy that's kind of dopey, knew a lot about cars, but he didn't really, like, lean on that. And then there was another guy that was kind of in between, I guess. So they had kind of the gamut of people covered, and they would talk about cars in ways that different people could be interested in and understand. So I think it was, you know, it's not like a total gearhead show, just kind of. That's good. It's a yeah. medium, medium level. Medium gearhead. Uh, the show Sneaky Pete. Never seen it. This show has, um, what's that guy's name? Giovanni? Giovanni Ribbage. Fabrizio. So he played uh, a guy who was mentally challenged in one of these movies. The Other Sister? Have you seen that movie? Uh, many, many years ago. It has that girl who yeah. was in Christmas Vacation and all the other movies. She's been in tons of stuff. Yeah. Juliana something? More? No. No. She was on X-Files. Juliet? Juliet Lewis? Lewis, yes. I don't like either of the two of them as actors. Huh. Never been a fan of either of the two of them. Huh. And so whenever I saw that movie where they were both like like mentally challenged, mm. I can't they're typecast to me in that because I really? never thought they were very good actors. I didn't like what they used, they did, and then they did that movie, and I'm like, I can't unsee that now. Huh. And so now I can't take him seriously. He was in something that I liked, and I, it's been a really long time. He was also in Gone in 60 Seconds, which I like the movie, even though it's Nicolas Cage, and it's, you know... That Nicolas, wasn't a bad movie. Nicolas Cage, but I like that movie. That was one, like, where I liked the cars in that movie because mm -hmm. they were just cool-looking cars, even yep. though I probably... You're just a pretty car. Don't I know there's a Shelby Mustang. Yeah, the rest of them I can't remember. So, but I liked the movie in and of itself. But he was in that. But I feel like he was in something else, like a... Not... He was in uh, Avatar... Eh, yeah, but it was like a more of a comedy type. It wasn't Clueless. Maybe it wasn't Clueless. I don't know. Uh, Empire Records? Was he in Empire Records? Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, I don't know. Never seen Sneaky Pete. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that guy. So if he's in it, I don't want to watch it. Ooh. Burn. Uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yep. I liked it. <laughs> uh, the movie was pretty good. I enjoyed it. I read the book many, many years ago. And I liked the book a lot. The movie, I thought, did a pretty good job. Yeah, I liked it too. I, I read the audiobook, and it was kind of nice because the guy who narrated the movie also narrated the audiobook. Oh, that's cool. So it was really easy to do a one for one. Yeah. We were talking about dolphins or something the other day, and I'm like, the smartest creatures on the planet? And my oldest son was like, yeah, they are really, like pretty smart. I'm like, no, they're the smartest creatures on the planet. <laughs> You'll get it one day. Uh, your Pixar movies. What's your favorite Pixar movie? Ooh. Man, that's pretty tough. Favorite. Um, wow. I don't know that I have a good answer for that. I Maybe Incredibles? Mine was the one that we saw at the theater downtown the other day. Inside Out. Really? I love that movie. Huh. It's one, it's, it's not a, a tentpole Pixar movie. But it's got Amy Poehler in it, and it's got like the all of the different 
thought character. She's mm-hmm. joy and sadness and disgust and anger and fear, I think. And the movie takes place in this girl's mind. And it dives deep into like some psychological uh, concepts, but in like a very cartoony kind of way. It speaks a lot of truth. Mm-hmm. And I love that movie. So I've never seen all of it. I started watching it one time. The kids saw it in the theater. I didn't go for some reason. And then we watched it at home one time. And I started it. And I got part of the way into it. And I was like, I'm going to be bawling at the end of this movie. I know it. Because mm. I could just feel like this is going to hit me thinking about my kids and, and all that stuff. And then I got pulled away for something. I didn't get to see the rest of it. It will go pretty much perfectly with the conversation we had last week. About like, oh, oh He's an 11 year old. Like, my right. daughter is reacting this way. I watched it with my, all three of my kids. My wife was doing something. We all just went, I think. Yes. And so I had a nice conversation with my son about, like, oh, when you get angry and you get mad, mm. like, which one of those things are, are winning out and why? And they all work together. Like, it's okay to be sad, like we talked about on here. The whole premise of that movie is they're trying to keep sadness from ruining everything. And hmm. so, in lieu of the girl being able to be sad, She's all of these other things that ends up being like, you know, hormonally angry and, and depressed and, you know, not feeling anything at all. Like it's super deep for the, the kids movie that it is. Yeah. And I liked it when I first saw it and we saw it the other day and I'm like, I love this movie. Huh. If, if you, the, the kids, the, the girl in the movie is I think 11 or something. I'm like, I doubt that kids that are 11 would get the, the gravity of what they're trying to explain. But it's not lost on me as a dad of, of kids. Hmm. So. Interesting. Well, maybe I'll have to pull that one out. Did you cry it. during Up? Man, did I cry yeah, during Up. I oh, boy. Yep. Why do they do that to you, Pixar? I don't know. Come on, man. Pixar is too good at that stuff. They know how to pull those strings. It doesn't take much to get me to cry, to be honest. But, yeah. I cry more at movies recently. Or I... I Tend to put myself emotionally in the place of the characters. Like, if it's a good movie, I will internalize things. Mm-hmm. And then it just kind of, like, emotion starts to come <clears> out. <throat> Where Pixar movies, I never thought that that would be a thing. It's just like a silly, fun cartoon. They mm-hmm. have a really good skill, and I'm sure they have probably have a whole school within the company that explains this thing. We should grab that motion sensor and just pull it over here because our lights keep turning off. They have a really good skill at taking an adult, uh, mature... No, those are the wrong words. But mature thought and they wrap it in this kid's story Mm -hmm. but like every single one of the movies has this thread through it that is in an actual big thinking point you know whereas like pretty much every other company that makes kids movies the life of pets secret life of pets like there's nothing in that nope i mean (laughs) in between disney and pixar oh yeah yeah but there's something in the dna of the the people that write for pixar that uh I don't know. It's like they start at a different place, and then they just end up in a kid's movie or something. I, I'm not sure how they do it. Uh, I was I, Speaking of secret behind the scene, maybe, yeah. type stuff, I have a friend who works at Pixar, mm-hmm. and he, we saw him when we were in California, and he, they had just wrapped on Toy Story 4, and he was saying, you know, I was like, well, how does it, how, is everybody happy with it? Like, he said, yeah, now that it's done, everybody's very happy with it, but there was a point where nobody was happy with it. Ooh. Yeah, and they had to kind of like rework. And I guess that's probably the way that goes for all of them. You know, I'm sure none of them are a home run right off well, the bat. I think from that very first trailer that I saw of Toy Story 4, I was in that boat. Hmm. I'm like, what in the world are you doing? It looks super dark and brooding, and I don't think I want to watch it anymore. Yeah. So that's good that they're that self-aware. It sounds like they are very self-aware, and they continue to work on these things until everybody is happy, or, you know, the major players are happy with how it's going. Like, they have pretty high standards. So that's cool. Um, And he said Keanu Reeves is amazing in it. (laughs) People are loving Keanu Reeves recently. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And good for him, you know? I like him. I've always liked him. People always talk about how bad of an actor he is, but, I mean... Do know. you think it comes from some ironic place that people are loving Keanu Reeves? I don't think so. I think it's coming from people are actually finally realizing that like you don't have to be a full range actor to be a good actor. Because that's be the big thing. Appreciated like, for what you do. He has yeah he has a narrow range I think, 
But a lot of people do. Like, Paul Rudd is amazing. Paul Rudd does one thing. That's true. You know what I mean? He doesn't age. But well, and too. he does that one thing. Maybe if he were to get a little older, <laughs> he, <gets laughs> he some would develop. But, I mean, you know, I think maybe people are just finally being okay with, like, he doesn't have a lot of range, but he's really good at the things that he does. Mm-hmm. Like, let him do those things and just be good at that and not worry about, like, you know, you can't be... F- Actually, I think he can be funny, but I don't know. Maybe there's an ironic thing to it. I don't feel that way, but... Okay, so pros and cons. Hedgehogs for pets. <laughs> uh, you, you take this one. Uh, I'm completely indifferent, which is ironic that I have a hedgehog as a pet. Uh, it exists in my house. People love... I mean, it's cute, but I guess we're just not... <laughs> it's a pet for non-attentive pet owners. It sleeps at night. You could take it out and it just kind of wanders around. It doesn't do any tricks. It doesn't retrieve anything. It's just kind of cute. Yeah. That's about it. I mean, I would say con just because of that. Like, it, there's no reason to have one. I mean, people like... I mean, this is from like Snuggle not having, and like but... love on it. And it's, it's not easy to do any of those things. It's like trying to love a, a hairbrush <laughs> that doesn't like you back. <laughs> That's a pretty good way to put it. Yeah, yeah I'm with you. That's what I would have thought. <laughs> I guess there's probably a lot of animals like that, honestly. But that's why I don't have a lot of different animals, because a lot of them don't really make good pets. Ooh, All right. That. Cool. The next little, one. Uh, little open, uh, declosing Quentin box. Tarantino films. I got to say, I'm not a fan. I've seen some that I liked. I mean, I think there's a lot of good stuff in Pulp Fiction. I think there's also a lot of terrible things that I would never like to see again for the rest of my life in Pulp Fiction. True that. But I feel that way about more of his stuff than otherwise. We watched uh, Kill Bill, Volume 1. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember the scene because I think I mentally blocked it out. But there was something in that movie, I kind of know the area, where I just shut down and was like, this is not... Like, there's no reason for people to see this. It, even I don't care if it's a bigger part of a bigger story or there's just like some stuff that you. Was it I think the, it, like a violence? I think it was there? like the uh, there was like a rape scene or something. Oh yeah. I don't remember, but that was kind of the turning point for me with Tarantino. I was like, you know what, this guy, I, I just don't. There's nothing here for me. So, I understand that he's really good at what he does. Again, but. I don't know I don't, why it, he has as much. I I'm I can watch a Quentin Tarantino movie. I'm not gonna run out and be like, oh my god, this is amazing. Um, I don't know why he has been elevated to the level that he has. Hmm. Maybe it's the rarity or the scarcity of films that he has that are just like, oh, people really like these. I mean, I don't find that they're bad. I think the stories I think are okay. Um, but I always wondered, like, how how does he do that? How did he get everybody on his side like that, like that quickly? Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, he has some that have been very, very popular. And they're good movies. Like Pulp Fiction, I think, is it stands out as a movie that's pretty unique. Um, but the other stuff I've seen, I don't know. It's just it's not my thing. I liked Inglorious Bastards. I thought that was a good movie. Uh, I saw Four Rooms. It was one of his earlier movies. And the only scene in that movie that I really remember was the very end. Uh, Reservoir Dogs. I think there's like a huge cult following with Reservoir Dogs. It's it's a heist movie that takes place in like a single warehouse. Yeah. And there's a lot of range, I guess, in the acting, and it's just it's something to watch. Yeah. I mean, I don't I don't follow it or analyze those movies as close as maybe some people do. But I think they're entertaining. Yeah, I think I saw. I think I saw Reservoir Dogs. I don't remember. Mr. Pink and Mr. Blue, and yeah, they all I mean, wear the I, suits. And yeah, I know what it looks like for sure, but I don't remember really anything about it. But I think after that Kill Bill thing, like I never, never even saw the second part of that movie because I didn't care. It was just like, I don't want that in my life. And I think because of that, I was just never really interested in seeing anything after that he ever did. So I don't know that I've seen anything past yeah. that. But. And Glorious Bastards was good. Um the, the German guy that's in it? I don't remember his name. But he did an amazing job in that movie. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, where are we? Spicy food. All right, we're over an hour, so this will be the last okay. one. Spicy food. I'm going to say con because I just can't hang. 
Okay. I like some of the flavors of like <laughs> what I I call spicy. Everybody else would probably call like super mild, but I like them. I just they mess me up and like I I don't know. It's just like not worthwhile to me. I like spicy food. Um, I've I've tried to find like not all the time, but I have a bottle of hot sauce in my house that was on the the hot ones show. Hmm. It's probably toward the middle, maybe toward the hotter end of the middle. But I mean, I'll put hot sauce on a lot of stuff just to give it a little burst. Hmm. Uh, have you ever done like a spicy food challenge? Kind no. Of thing? no, no. Why okay. would you do that? That doesn't make any sense to me. No. Uh, peer pressure. <laughs> that's the reason I did it. Okay. Did see, it. That, that that's one thing I'm. I'm very happy with where I've come with peer pressure. Yep. I can see that. Forget about you. that. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, yep. that's that's not something I've ever been interested in. There a friend of mine, Jason, we went one time to like one of the wing places, like our families went together, and they had this like eat so many hot, you know, like super hot wings in this amount of time and you get like everybody's meal is free or something like crazy. And so he did it. Or he tried to do it. I don't think he got it, but just watching him, like, be absolutely miserable for, like, an hour. Like, dude, I will buy dinner for everybody. This this is not worthwhile. That is also one of those events in life where you don't know that thing about yourself until you've eaten, like, the Scotch Bonnet crazy whatever pepper. I did the hot wing thing at a place called Quaker Steak and Lube in uh, Virginia. And it comes with, like, six wings in this little egg crate thing. Steak and Lube. Yeah. I had to sign a waiver and wear rubber gloves. Man. It was terrible. Oh my goodness, it was terrible. It was, was sweating. Terrible. Heart was all beating. Your face just kind of burns and you're leaking everywhere. <laughs> yeah, it's not a good sight. Like, it's not, oh, I put way too much. It's not something to do on a first date. <laughs> did you do it on a first date? No, I did it with a bunch of dummies. That's the only reason I did it, because I was with a bunch of dummies and it was peer pressure. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Well, don't ever expect me to do that. Well, there, okay, since we're on the show, I was thinking about something. Okay. That uh, our, our buddies, Matt and Destin over there, it's like we should do a combined podcast like trivia thing hmm. to where if you get the question wrong, you have to eat a spicy chicken wing. Ooh. Like a super spicy wing? I don't know what super is. It sounds like super <laughs> to you is not super to me. No, no. But no, I don't no. know if they like spicy stuff because then it wouldn't be as fun. It would just be like, ah, this is, this is good. I like chicken. Thank you. I mean, you know, we could get together and just eat chicken. Though. That would be I mean, that too. would be cool, too. But I thought it would be a really fun episode. Hmm. Yeah, that would. We'll have to get them in town sometime. Oh, no, our lights Man, are going lights. off. What's all right, that? lights are going off. That's a pretty good way yeah. to end the show. I have to paint his butt cheeks first. Oh, well, <laughs> all right. All right, zoom in on that camera. Um, where can people find you? On Instagram at the PI Workshop and on Twitter at Josh Make Stuff. And you can find both of us and all of us at I Like to Make Stuff on all the stuff. Um... If you want to support this show, Patreon is an excellent way to do that, is to support all of the I Like to Make Stuff stuff. It's all in one place, one Patreon, at patreon.com slash I Like to Make Stuff. We would appreciate it. Yeah. And you don't have to do that. I mean, if you just want to, like, you know, say hi, that's cool, too. If you want to share the show with people that you think might like it, that would be cool as well. And we got all these pros and cons from someone who listens to the show. So if you have some ideas out there or you want to know our particular stance on any given topic, reach out to us on the No Instructions podcast on Instagram or any one of those uh, aforementioned social media sites and let us know. Yeah. And we'll talk about them. Do that. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Now I got to do the, the face and I'm scared. Scared. Don't be scared. Whoa. Zerp, zerp. Whoa. Ah.